one of the most important things that I've learned from my TEFL course, and this is regardless of the language you teach, what you do in the last five minutes is what will stick with your students. So if in those last five minutes you, you you're 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 telling something funny, you're 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 giving some positive review, you're you're talking about something that the student enjoys, especially when it's the first lesson or a trial lesson, I think then there's more possibility that a student will book a next lesson or or even even yeah five or ten lessons. Yeah. We're good to go. All right. Uh, hello, Kenny. Very nice to meet you. Um, you sent an email to me explaining a little bit about your website and your experience on italki. Mm -hmm. um, I know you have a very diverse uh, background because you told me about how you live in Spain and where you're mm -hmm. from. So I'd like to just to, for you to introduce yourself and tell us who you are, please. Well, uh, yeah, my name, of course, is Kenny. And one of the most important things in my life are languages, not only as a teacher, but also as a student. So I teach um, Dutch and actually Flemish, my native tongue, because I'm originally from Belgium, um, English, Italian, and uh, French. Uh, but I use italki also myself uh, to learn multiple languages. At the moment, um, Portuguese, German, Afrikaans, Greek, and Catalan. And oh, I forgot Danish and not Danish and Greek. Yeah, okay, I have, I have all of them. Yeah. Wow. So um, <laughs> I've, I have sometimes have the feeling that Italki is my house or something mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm always on on the website because languages are a bit my passion. So. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see that. So those are the languages that you are that you've learned on Italki as well, or they're the ones that you teach on Italki. So I teach um, Dutch. Flemish and then English, Italian and French and the other languages I'm, I'm studying or mostly speaking, I, I, I prefer um, conversation classes because I study on my own. I have my books, I have my apps. So I teach four, the, according to Italki, I teach five languages, but Dutch and Flemish is the same, is actually the same. And the other languages I um, study, I have most languages, I have every week one lesson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what? So I've taken lessons in six languages on Italki. A few of them are the ones that you have mentioned, but not Danish nor um, nor uh, a Greek. Um, but when I took a uh, when I was studying Dutch, I was learning with a woman from uh, South Africa, actually, um, and uh, and I remember doing a lot of research online about uh, Flemish versus Dutch, um, mm -hmm. and I know that uh, that it could be a little bit of a hot topic in terms of uh, talking about whether it's a dialect or its own language. And, and there are some other, you know, languages like uh -huh. that where people want to say, is that a dialect or is it a language? So since you're a polyglot, I'd love to talk as much about lear language learning as about language mm -hmm. teaching today, if that's okay, mm -hmm. but we will make okay. time for language Perfect. teaching. Yeah, yeah so, no uh, problem. Yeah, so I'd like to just know from the horse's mouth, are there any common misconceptions or assumptions about any of the languages that you teach? Misconceptions. So I teach actually main, mainly Flemish. Mm -hmm. And I think I have also a few students who are, I teach yeah, Dutch. It's actually, this, for me, it's the same language, but especially the people who want to learn Dutch, they don't really, um, often they don't know there is like something like Dutch in Belgium. And if they don't, if if they know it, they often don't know there's a difference. And there's a there's a depending on the person you speak to, the um, some people consider it a separate language. Some people say just another version. I think in general people con consider nowadays there's like two different varieties. So if you open a dictionary, you will see Belgian Dutch and Dutch from the Netherlands when something is specific. It's a bit the difference. The differences are stronger than between like. English from the United Kingdom and English from, from Canada or, or from the United States. And less than, for example, uh, Portuguese, European Portuguese and Brazilian Portuguese. There's some, somewhere in between. Mm. But I think what most people don't realize often is um, the language I teach. I teach standard Belgian Dutch or standard Dutch. There's a big difference between how people speak. There are, I think there, there are many dialects. So when I, 
um, when I have a student, a new student from Belgium who's living in Belgium, has studied for a few months, a few years Dutch, that person starts speaking, then I can know, okay, you're from that city. And Belgium, Belgium is smaller than New York, so I think, or Flanders. Or Flanders is smaller than New York or so. Yeah, uh, Flanders is very small. We have like uh, six or seven million inhabitants. But every city, every region has its own dialect or regional dialect. And people often, I think, underest people often think, okay, I, I study a language and I will be able to communicate, yeah, I study language at a very high level and then I will be able to communicate with everyone. Mm. And that's often not the case. I have a very high level of Italian. I, I would say C2 plus because I have been speaking it, using it for 10 years. I have lived for three years in Italy. My family-in-law is uh, from Italy. Um, but when I go to the south of Italy and I'm in the village of my family-in-law, often I don't understand because they speak, yeah, they speak Italian, they speak a dialect. So I think a, a common misconception is, okay, I speak the, lev the language and I will be able to communicate with everyone. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think people sometimes underestimate that also native speakers sometimes have difficulties. I imagine somebody from france who goes to quebec sometimes would say okay oof, oh, oh i have to adapt i don't know what i don't know what they're i don't know i don't understand the pronunciation i don't know what which words they're using so and i think that's a bit a frustration some students have i have a high level of dutch i have a high level of flemish but i'm still not able to understand what the lady uh, on on in the at the, the at the shop for example is is talking about with the the shop assistant for example yeah and i love actually from what you just said my favorite part is that you use two different contrasts to make a contrast so you spoke about how you know uh, the difference between um dutch from the netherlands and dutch from uh, uh um uh, um from from belgium. belgium how it could fall in between the difference between uh brazilian and portugal po portuguese and um, I believe you also said uh, English um, from from the United from Kingdom, from the United Kingdom versus from from the US. So it's mm -hmm. good to speak about this because um, throughout this interview, this is interview uh, th throughout this series. This is interview number 14. And uh -huh. I've spoken with a lot of uh, teachers, as you could imagine, um, polyglot teachers who teach multiple languages or even just one language. And we've spoken mm -hmm. about the different varieties of languages. So I've spoken mm -hmm. to Spanish, um, you know, a woman from Argentina who spoke about the difference between Argentinian Spanish versus Mexican, Mexican Spanish, for example. And I think it's good for us to recognize, and you just pointed it out, that mm -hmm. not all differences of varieties have the same proximity right like some mm -hmm. of them may be more different than others mm -hmm. and that's something i learned when i was learning french you know the quebecois versus the parisian mm -hmm. it, it's like you know that is not exactly the same distance as american english versus um uk english there are mm -hmm. many factors as you said mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. definitely good yeah. to know um mm -hmm. okay great there's there's so much to dive into um so i'd like to talk a little bit of your teaching experience now and i know that you mm -hmm. uh, have have a website uh something polyglot mm -hmm. but but i'm not sure does that focus on teaching or does that just focus on learning would you say so i have my website and i have my blog and oh, okay. i use i use actually my website a bit like for, a bit for marketing and on my blog, sometimes I, I publish, but I actually use way more my social media. I'm very active on Twitter, for example. I have a very active language community. We have hashtag Lang uh, TWT. And you have a lot of interesting people who, who share stuff. If you have a question, you, you get an answer from a native speaker or somebody who's learning the language. You can find um, you can find students. I found students on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and uh, yeah, if 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 you want to, yeah, an, a language exchange, for example, it's sometimes easier on Twitter than on all those websites like Tandem and Hello Talk or something. Um, because I think often, the, like, for example, on Twitter, you have a lot of people who are very yeah, into languages. And then you find somebody who has the same passion. Sometimes if you look for someone on, on a, um, a language exchange website like Hello Talk, you just have people who want to practice the language because they're living in the country for, um, and they want to practice the language a little bit with a, an, another, another person, with a native speaker. In a language community, you have, yeah, there's more interaction, especially on Twitter. 
and um, yeah, also for me personally, as an Italki teacher, I, I found yeah students on on Twitter, on Instagram, um, and yeah, it's it's a very yeah. I, I, I've met people. I, I have some people I could consider like um, digital friends. <laughs> By coincidence, last yeah. week I was in Barcelona. I I met a few of those those people. Yeah, and I met my. I have a Catalan uh, Italki teacher. I also met in in Barcelona. That's that's amazing. I haven't met any of my students in person and a lot of them want to immigrate to Canada. So they're always like, like, once I get there, Ryan, we're going to go out. We're going to have like, we're going to meet up. But I haven't met any of 400 students in person. So I'd love to know what was that experience like to actually meet people? To actually meet people. So I, these are all, so I met two of my teachers and then two of uh, people I've been talking to on, on Twitter. So I, I have had I had conversations with these people on Zoom on Skype, so I I had an idea who they were, but that's a bit. So you you know upfront, okay, this is we're going to have subjects to talk about. So it's not like you you meet somebody from the first time. You have to check out if if you like this person or not. My Catalan teacher, I've had fifty uh, lessons this year, so this when we met, it was like we we just continued. It was just yeah. continuing the the lesson. <laughs> Actually, it, it was like a, it felt like a lesson because if you've had fifty lessons with a student, in in my yeah. case, mm -hmm. often it feels a bit like somewhere in between the student and friend or teacher and friend. Mm -hmm. So um, and that continued in 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 real life. The conversation, the lesson continued. Yeah. yeah. How how could it not? Right. Like I mean, sitting down with because like for me, I've been on the teaching side and the student side of that. Right. So, for mm -hmm. example, my uh, Spanish tutor, Juliet, we've had maybe 70 or 80 lessons together. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I ever met her in Colombia, it'd probably be just picking up where you left off. Right. Like, yeah, because the yeah. introduction, you've already done the introduction. And in my experience, especially as a student, you share a lot. I have a lot of students who share their lives. They feel this is like, a, sometimes I think for m many people, this is like a safe environment. And sometimes, very often, uh, I, I've wrote this, I think, yesterday on Twitter, we are, we're not teachers. We are not only teachers. We're coach, we're, we're therapists sometimes, we're clowns. When I teach children, <laughs> I feel like a clown sometimes, which is great. Uh, we're friends, we're acquaintances, we're, we're, we're a lot of things all together in, in, one, in one person. And I think many people, uh, feel the need to talk especially in in this yeah these past few years and they they find that the possibility with with a teacher which is great because when you learn a language one of the most difficult things is talking about your emotions it's very difficult and if you can do that in another language you have like yeah you, you talk about your emotions you feel good because you're sharing but you're doing it also in another language and i think if you learn if when you're learning a language you have to talk about everything. What did you eat this morning? Or how do you feel now that you have broken up with your, with your partner? Everything. Because that's a, that's a language. Because when you're going to use a language in real life, it will be like this. Yeah, can I have a coffee, please? Or I feel terrible because my, my partner just left me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, you're putting yourself in such a vulnerable position. Well, for some people, it's the most vulnerable position they've ever put themselves mm -hmm. in by going online and uh, meeting people. And you mentioned Tandem and and I and Hello Talk. And if I had a nickel for every time that I've downloaded and mm. re-downloaded those, I'd be rich. But uh, you know, it, like whether it be meeting exchange partners or um, you know just like booking with a teacher on on the internet, it could be incredibly mm -hmm. uh, vulnerable and it could be incredibly nerve wracking. So being able to break through that seal and to establish some sort of rapport that could mm -hmm. put you in a position where you're incredibly uh, like you actually, uh, you know, foster a strong relationship and you feel like you could open up emotionally. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think so. I've, I'm, 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 I think being vulnerable uh, is, is a superpower. And I've noticed I, I'm I'm very very vulnerable. I share things also on Twitter. I, I don't care. I, I share how I feel. I, I tell I, I share with my students also or as a, as a as a student myself. And I've noticed if you do that, people also start talking. They feel okay. You share, so I share. And mm -hmm. for me, as a, as a teacher, that helps to create a relationship. Mm -hmm. And 
there, there are people who are, are giving me raving reviews on italki and i think it's not only because i'm a good teacher um, i hope i'm a good teacher <laughs> but also because i think because i'm um i feel i'm more than a teacher so i'm not only a teacher uh, yeah. I'm, I'm passionate I, I feel this is what i i i'm going to do this till i till till i retire but i I'm, i feel also i'm more than a teacher. i i want to be it's maybe a friend is a bit too much but in, in some students feel like friends sometimes but more like um yeah, a coach or, or helping them to to improve but helping um, them all if necessary to talk about yeah whatever uh, they want to talk about awesome i feel like we have just kind of um Pro partially i suppose because you are a um a polyglot and we're living in the here and now and you're always trying to improve and like for me mm -hmm. i've kind of let my language ability slip in other languages but the passion and the fire is still there and i know I, i'm mm -hmm. going to get back to it so i know it's easy to li live in the here and now but since you're talking about you know your long-term goals and your long-term plans i'd like to actually go back and just ask you how you got started as a language teacher and when and where um so in 2011 i moved to rome and i started teaching private lessons to children and family english lessons an italian family um just because i wanted to live in rome and that seemed like the easiest solution i didn't have any experience and then when i moved to spain in 2016 i think or 20, i don't recall 2016 i think um my plan was okay maybe i should start teaching it was a plan and then I kind of find a job in an academy where I had to help students with English. I had difficulties. I had to explain English grammar in Spanish, which was fantastic for my, my level of Spanish because I had to translate all the time. Um, and then I, yeah, I liked it. I did a TEFL course. I changed jobs. And then, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, the, the pandemic came and I decided to switch. But I didn't decide to switch. I lost my job. And then, yeah um during the pandemic i thought i i started with lessons uh, first as a student on uh, italki and i liked it and i thought why not and now, now we're here like uh, 1700 lessons later i think Whoa. and yeah i'm uh, yeah this is i feel like this is what i want to do this is my it, it's it's i think the one to one approach is is something i really like because you can you can help students with specific things. You can see the progress. Often the students ask me, but do you, you, know, do you feel I'm, I'm making progress? And I can tell, I really, every time I can tell, yes, if I can pair with now, and I can give examples. Like I have a file every time with the students, a Google file, and then I can, I can, I can, I can see the progress. Because every, they have, often they have one or two lessons a week. And after, if you compare with two or three months ago, with all my students, there's no exception. I can I can give them exam examples, and I think that's important for their motivation also. Because sometimes, often pe people say, "I'm not making oh again the same mistake." But if you compare with three months ago, often you can say, "But yeah, three months ago you didn't even realize you made a mistake, and now you're you 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 realize it's a mistake, and the next step will be you will be able to correct yourself, and then the next step, boom." You, you won't make the mistake anymore. God, that's think, actually mind blowing. Yeah, like you, yeah. you realize it now. So that's some progress. And mm -hmm. then the next step is to fix the mistake. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I think for me, one of the most important things for me as a teacher is that I'm also a student because I, I had this week a student who started crying during my lesson because she was frustrated that she made the same mistake again. And I can recognize that frustration because I started Greek this year and yeah, <laughs> it's not so easy. And um, I'm, I, I, I recognize her frustration because I experience the same frustration. The only difference is that I know with all the language I've studied that this frustration is normal. And one misconception about polyglots, in my opinion, is, is okay, oof, every, oh, learning a language, easy peasy, piece of cake. No, <laughs> it's never a piece of cake it's not um when somebody says, okay i I'll, I'll teach you a lesson the easy way well sorry there's no easy way so maybe if you yeah okay maybe if you speak spanish and you want to learn italian it will be easier but it will not be easy 
that's a, a bit a misconception in general i think it's not it can be easier it can be fun it can, you can enjoy the process um but i don't i don't think it's ever easy even for me when i started afrikaans which is as close as you get to dutch as possible mm -hmm. it's still difficult because it's so similar that i sometimes don't know which language am i speaking so oh, it's okay. it, it's every it's always difficult it's it's never really easy and that's a bit of misconception i think in general about language learning it it can be easy and that's what some yeah uh, publicity so we, we see and they say okay it, it's easy yeah, click on this link and you'll learn english in seven days or seven months yeah uh, seven days is completely impossible seven months <laughs> yeah will be easier to reach your goals um but also yeah and polyglots i think many I, I know a few of them and, and there is no one who says, okay, this is easy. A language is easy. You can learn a language the easy way. It's not possible, but it can be fun. I'm convinced as a teacher, you can make it fun and you can, as a, a good teacher can motivate the student that the, the student wants to continue, that the student sees his progress or that I help the student to see their pro, pro, uh, progress. So what does your uh, what does your plan look like for language learning? Maybe we could talk about you, even your goals for 2022. You just started mm -hmm. Greek. You've had 50. Do you say you had 50 classes with one of your teachers already this year? Uh, no, um, Catalan on, on one year. I started one year ago and I have had 50 class one one a week, wow. let's say. Yeah. So what is your pro well, what is your kind of learning plan like? And are there any big goals that you have for your language learning in this year of 2022? Well, um, I, I usually change every month. I check at the end of the month. What do you want to want to do next month? What I feel like doing? Because if you want to consider an entire year, a lot can happen in a year. Yeah. yeah. And it's very difficult. And I don't really have specific goals because I'm more enjoying the progress. I, I want to reach, I want to progress. That's it. Mm -hmm. and now I'm focusing a bit more on Greek because it's a new language. And I feel, okay, I have to focus on this language because in the beginning, it's very important to be consistent to to do something every day and that's what i'm doing and the other languages are a bit wandering around at the moment you have a high level and i have for example i think a high level in catalan so i could easily say okay this week i'm not going to do anything and that that won't make a difference but if you just start with a language it's easy to lose what you've just learned so with a new language when you start with some a new language you have to do something every day uh, i I uh, usually start with an, uh, I don't know if you know the, the Asimil books. Asimil? No. I don't Asimil? Know. No. No. This is uh, a French editor and they have uh, 100 lessons and they lead you to B2 level. And every day you have, you start with one lesson every day and you progress, you assimilate. You don't really have to mm. study. And mm. it's, I always start very slow and then I, I continue and I'll see. You. Uh, um, what's where I end up at the end of the year. I don't have it. It's a bit an easy position because I don't need to learn the language. There's no, maybe except for Spanish, I live in Spain. So I, I, I want to improve my Spanish. I have a high level, but still sometimes I have difficulties understanding people, uh, especially when they're wearing a mask, which makes it <laughs> a tad more yeah. difficult also. Um, but the other language is a bit for, it's, it's for fun. It's my passion. I enjoy it. So I don't, I don't have like go some people they participate they uh, sit exams because then they have okay i have a goal to live to i i, I that give that motivates me but my motivation is a bit more in intrinsic so it's i i don't need to, i don't really need a goal the only thing i do every month i check what do i want to do this month next month yeah what priority because if you speak multiple languages it's very difficult to say, okay, I'm going to do every uh, something and uh, every day in every language, but yeah. uh, I, I speak 10 languages. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> spend half an hour every day on every language because then I don't have time to, to teach anymore. Exactly. Yeah. And by the way, I really appreciate your time. I'm in no rush, but I mm. uh, definitely don't want to miss out on anything here. So just mm -hmm. a little bookmark before I forget. Um, since you just spoke about the Asimil books, I'd love to put those in the um, if one of us remembers to put put maybe a link to some of these resources and your social media channels and your 
uh, websites mm -hmm. in the box below. So if anyone's okay. interested, check that out. If, if you want to learn any of those five languages with Kenny, <laughs> uh, check out his profile yes. too. Um, but I just wanted to ask, do you have, because I haven't spoken to any interviewee about this yet, social media. Do you have mm -hmm. any suggestions for other teachers who are watching right now who want to like build some sort of social media presence to potentially attract students? Um, do you have any general tips for them to get started? Yeah, um, I, I think I'm a bit lucky lucky because i speak multiple and teach multiple languages and i'm i have been very active i'm very active so i i'm i'm especially in twitter i'm there every day i speak with people i'm very i i enjoy it um i know many other uh, teachers have a profile and they're not very active and i think that the trick is you have to be active now this is something i enjoy i know other people they make videos on their youtube channel channel this is something i don't I tried it, but it's something I, I don't really enjoy. So for me, I think if you want to be active on social media, do something you enjoy. I've seen my, my Catalan teacher has an, a very active um, um, channel on, on YouTube and that works for him. He has like 1000 or, or more followers and he gets students from that uh, channel. I'm more active. I, I prefer more uh, Instagram and Twitter. I enjoy it. I, I participate. It's, it's, it's not an effort. I try to make a specific profile. I have a specific profile for Dutch and Flemish. But I didn't really enjoy it. And yeah, there were no results. I got more students from my general profile where I talk about my languages, language learning. So I think it's possible, but you have to put a lot of effort in it. I see the same. My, my, uh, my Catalan teacher tells me, yeah, it's a lot of work. As if you make a video and then you have to edit it, you have subtitles and maybe there's a mistake and oh, you have to do it again. And there's something with the sound. So I think it's a lot of effort, but if you enjoy it, go for it. I think if you have an idea, I think the problem with, and most people teach English on italki, the problem is there are, there's already a lot of material. So for, so it's very difficult. You, you should, I think if you want to start, you should make something very specific. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know something, for example, um, for uh, Spanish speakers, how, um, uh, titles of movies are being translated from, Engl from English to Spanish or the other way around. Something very specific and, and then you have to be very active, I think, to attract people, followers. Because from the, if, if I, I mean, yeah, it's not, uh, not all different people, but yeah, in Twitter and Instagram, I maybe have 3,500 followers. From all of those, I have yeah, maybe got six students. I don't know if that's worth it, but I enjoy it. So it's not a problem for somebody to invest so much time in social media. If you don't like it and the result is only six students, it's maybe better to do something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I, I don't think that, and I'm totally fine with this, but I don't think that the amount of students I will attract with my YouTube channel will ever equate to the amount of hours that I put into my YouTube channel, mm -hmm. but that's okay. Cause like, as you said, it's like, for me, it's a, it's a hobby. I love video making and that is my mm -hmm. modality. But for, for mm -hmm. other people, it could be the, the images on Instagram. It could be the, uh, the mm -hmm. text on Twitter. So it's, you know, to each their own and it's good for you to find, mm -hmm. um, I think the modality that works for you or the, uh, the platform that works for you and also to find, uh, to find a niche and find something that mm -hmm. will help people. Cause that could help motivate you as well. I mean, my mm -hmm. YouTube channel started as a, travel youtube channel and that lasted yeah. three months <laughs> and then mm -hmm. i i made a couple of videos about italki and that's all that people were watching and i was like oh okay mm -hmm. that is what i'm doing and that's you know, yeah the way forward yeah exactly mm -hmm. um okay just another topic if you're comfortable mm -hmm. talking about it i know mm -hmm. that you're a parent and i actually thought about making a category for parents um in this um parents i'm 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 not a parent Oh, you're you're not. I have so, children. So, <laughs> I, oh, I have so, two dogs. I, I have two dogs. Maybe that. Dogs. <laughs> that's, that's, oh. Like, <laughs> I, I, you said I don't daughters. have daughters. No. Okay. All no, right, no, right, no. Right. I have I have two dogs. No parent. No, no. Sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Cool. I definitely misheard you before because we were talking about this. Ah, no problem. And I thought you said daughters. All right. Okay. Fair ah, no dogs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boom. 
Fair enough. Um, so basically, um, we could finish up right there. Are there any other kind of topics that you wanted to talk about that we didn't touch on today? Um, hmm. I don't think so. Yeah. No, I for I think if 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 it's like about I talk, I think one of the important thing is is to to communicate a lot with your students. Also, I I know it's a lot of effort, but what I do, and it it I I've seen it where it, it I I get results from this. So I give reviews very often, not every time, but I give them reviews on their profile page and also in the message. I copy it because they don't check their, their I think that uh, they, they don't get a message. I don't get a message when some, a, a teacher publishes something. And I respond, I, I, I give them a, re, a review. I give something positive. I, I, I mentioned something positive and I've seen the results because then they publish something on my profile page, which is also nice. The next lesson after the next lesson and, and that communication, I think that that works. It's it's also a lot of effort. I do that at the end of my day at 10 o'clock in the evening, um, but I've seen the results. So I think that's something some people, some of my students, uh, teachers don't write anything, they don't do anything, but I, I also like it when my, 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 my teacher writes something, gives me positive feedback. And it's, it's important for a student. And I think maybe some teachers who are not students themselves, it's very nice to hear, okay, this was a good lesson. Oh yeah, you made progress. Okay, oh, you, you, uh, you still make some basic mistakes, but yeah, we're pro uh, you're making progress. And one of the most important things that I've learned from my TEFL course, and this is regardless of the language you teach, what you do in the last five minutes is what will stick with your students. So if in those last five minutes, you, you, you're, you're, you're telling something funny, you're, you're, you're giving some positive review, you're, you're talking about something that the student enjoys, especially when it's the first lesson or a trial lesson, I think then there's more possibility that a student will book a next lesson or, or even, even yeah, five or 10 lessons. Yeah. Fantastic, that is, that is great advice right there. Um, thank you so much, Kenny, it was great chatting You're welcome, to you. it was Anyone very nice this, chatting to you. Go mm -hmm. ahead and uh, book a lesson with uh, Kenny. He speaks all these languages, maybe he'll be taking a, a lesson with one of you in one of the languages he's learning. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Who, Who knows? knows? Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Thank very you, good. Ken. It was very nice talking to you. Okay. Sure. Bye bye. Cheers.